Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Caribbean Exports webinar series, Talk and Exports, which we have been doing since the start of the pandemic in May. Um, my name is Gail Gollop. I am the legal and trade specialist at Caribbean Export. And part of my portfolio is intellectual property which is what we'll be talking about here today. Um, this week, in conjunction with CARIPI, the CARIFORM Intellectual Property and Innovation Project, we shall be hosting two webinars, this one today and one on Thursday. Um, today, we have Wendy Hollingsworth, with the, who is with the CARIPI Project, who shall be our moderator, and Erica Smith of Intellect Management Services, who will be our presenter. Before we go right into it, I will just give you a little presentation about Caribbean export and what we'll be doing here today. <clears throat> I'm just bringing up my screen now. <clears throat> okay, so as most of you may know of Caribbean Export, I have looked at the attendees and many of you, names I recognize either from um, or business support organizations throughout the Cariforum region or, or um, small and medium sized enterprises within the region. Welcome all of you. So briefly, I'll just, for those who don't know, I will tell you a little about Caribbean Export. Caribbean Export was established in 1996 as the Regional Trade and Investment Promotion Agency in the Cariforum region. Our mission to enhance the competitiveness and value of the Caribbean brands through the delivery of transformative targeted interventions and export development and investment promotion. <clears throat> Currently, Caribbean Export is implementing the 11th European Development Fund's Regional Private Sector Development Program. Through this, we seek to contribute to the gradual integration of CARIFORM countries into the world economy, enhancing regional economic growth and by extension, alleviating poverty. So what does that mean? What are we doing? We enhance the competitiveness of regional small and medium sized enterprises. That is you, your businesses. Through that, we seek to promote trade and development among the Cariforum region, promote stronger trade and investment relations among with our neighbors in the French Caribbean outermost regions, as well as the overseas countries and territories of the EU, promote stronger trade and investment cooperation between CARICOM and the Dominican Republic. And we also serve as the Secretariat of the Caribbean Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, where we work with 23 member countries. We work in a variety of sectors, agro-processing, creative industries, specialized tourism, manufacturing, ICT, and renewable energy. This week, with the Intellectual Property Series, we shall be partnering with one of our newest partners, the CARIPI Project, the CARIFORM Intellectual Property and Innovation Project. This is a project also funded by the 11th EDF and implemented by the European Union's Intellectual Property Office. It was set up to strengthen the intellectual property rights environment in CARIFORM as a means of fostering trade and investment and stimulating innovation and competitiveness in the private sector. So the objective of this quite new project, and they're now starting um, to bring together stakeholders from the Caribbean, Cariform countries, the EU, and relevant international organizations with the goals of creating stronger IP offices, having um, SMEs, many of you will be familiar or should be familiar with your intellectual property offices. Each country has an office and many of them um, many of them 
have challenges with resources and one of the and resources and one of the aims of this project is to strengthen these IP offices so that they can serve you, the small and medium-sized enterprises, thus enhancing our exports within the region. The project also seeks to ensure the availability of effective intellectual property right enforcement mechanisms. Therefore, if your IP has been stolen, if you have a trademark and someone else is using it, we are seeking to ensure that you have recourse. The enforcement mechanisms are there and will be used effectively so that your intellectual property is protected. The project also seeks to contribute to the development of a sustainable and innovative private sector and also makes it easier to do business between the EU and CARIFORM and also within the CARIFORM region itself. So today we're talking about the role of IP in developing your brand. Um, at Caribbean Export, we have been seeking to raise awareness about intellectual property. And I think we've come a long way. Um, we've come a long way since we started the program. Um, many times we'll find that even though our, there's some people who don't know or understand their intellectual property, some people who have intellectual property and don't know how to maximize the use of their intellectual pro property. So today we'll be speaking about the role of the IP and the importance it places in developing your brand. How do we create your brand value? What are the key IP tools to be used, whether it be a trademark, um, geographical indication, etc.? cetera? Um, how you can protect these brands from theft yeah, and we will use some practical examples to show what happens when your brand, you have sought to protect your brand or you have not protected your brand and, and what the ramifications are. We'll also demonstrate creating your brand from inside out using intellectual property. And we'll use some case studies from the region which will, so that you will understand how, how this affects you. So you can see a practical example. So this morning, first, I will introduce our moderator, Dr. Wendy Hollingsworth. Dr. Hollingsworth has worked with us extensively at Caribbean Export. She's trained in intellectual property rights and IP asset management at leading institutions around the world. And she's also a certified patent valuation analyst. She works as a consultant with national, regional, and international institutions in the areas of IP asset management, creativity, and in innovation for new product development, the development of national IP strategies and environmental issues. Wendy also lectures at UE Cave Hill in creativity and innovation management for entrepreneurship and biosafety risk management. And currently she's working as a consultant with the Karipu project as the intellectual property expert and activities coordinator. So you'll be seeing a lot more Wendy in the next four years as the project continues. So before I close, I just want to remind you that we have two seminars this week, two webinars. This one today and on Thursday, we have a webinar on monetizing intellectual property, where we'll, uh, Wendy will also moderate there. And we have a presenter, Mr. Chris Doherty, who would work closely with Caribbean Export as well. He's the managing director of Windward Commodities. So that will happen on Thursday. So if you have not signed up, we urge you to sign up and meet with us back here at midday on Thursday. Um, that's all from me now. Um, I just want to remind you, Wendy will take over for now and she will give an, a brief introduction and then we'll go into the main presentation. But I just need to remind you that we have a evaluation at the end of this exercise. So after you are signed, when you close the webinar, you leave the webinar, you will see an evaluation with just a couple questions that we beg you to answer. We need to know how we were doing. We need to know if this was relevant to you. We need to know, so we need to know what you want and we need to know how effective and efficient we are doing in presenting this to you. So we urge you to, to answer those questions at the end. And I will now hand it over to Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Um, good afternoon to all of our attendees. Um, at last glance, I realized that we've got almost 230 and the numbers are climbing um, who are joining us today. So welcome to you all. 
just a few, um, if you want, housekeeping matters before we get into the full pre um, presentation. Uh, the presentation will be for one hour, so we'll have about 30, 35 minutes for the actual presentation and um, quite a lot of time for the question and answer session. So, you know, so you can actually start to delve into areas that are, that have arrived, that came up and that are relevant to you. What we would want in terms of the, your questions is that you type your questions in the chat and we will then read those questions out and you will get Dr. Smith to answer the questions for you. All mics will be um, off during the presentation um, session because then that will facilitate um, better um, audio in terms of not being able to interrupt the, the speaker when she is um, mm -hmm. actually making the presentation. As Gail said, today's topic will be on branding. Um, it's a very interesting topic for businesses, but it, it, it is one that is of um, great importance, especially now. Um, very often a key question that a business tend to ask especially micro and small enterprises in our experience is how can they build their brand equity and, and behind that question is how can we make our business more profitable how can we get more customers how can we retain our customers so your brand is what customers connect with and it is a promise that you make to your customers and it influences how you are perceived in the market space and ultimately it also influences your bottom line so our speaker today, Dr. Erica Smith, will speak to us about the key strategies that can be used to build a compelling brand using intellectual property tools. So Dr. Smith has um, an undergraduate degree in law and management and a master's of science degree in international business. And she has an LLM in intellectual property law and also in international sports law man and management. She was currently awarded her doctorate and her dissertation was focused on copyright management. Erica has authored various business management courses and is the head, um, and is one of the head tutors at the with the WIPO Academy. Over the years, she has implemented numerous projects um, for various regional and international agencies and governments. Her clients include the World Intellectual Property Organization, um, the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. The Jamaican Business Development Corporation, the Caribbean Development Bank, Compete Caribbean, the REACH project, which was implemented with WIPO and the Inter-American Development Bank, as well as the International Federation um, of the Phonographic Industry and the Caribbean Export Development Agency. Dr. Smith, we welcome you to speak with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Hi, hello, um, I'm Erica. I know some of you based on the attendees list. I have half an hour more or less, so it's not going to be the most comprehensive presentation, but um, I try to focus it based on the assumption that the attendees are generally SMEs uh, from within the Caribbean. So I hope it will be interesting for you, relevant, and I look forward to your questions. So. Okay, so just to explain, it is not a session on branding per se, and it's also not going to be heavily legal focus. It's, it's going to be about the commercial use of intellectual property rights. So Wendy gave a little intro in terms of defining branding. And in fact, there is no clear definition of it. And I've given some examples, which range from the definition I think most people relate to, that is the identification of a product or service as belonging to a specific entity. But it can also speak to 
the entire organization um, as a brand and everything that sorry everything that entity does to be recognized in the marketplace uh, branding can also speak to individuals but that will not be the subject of today's webinar although some of the concepts will apply for individual branding as well so why invest in branding Ultimately, you're looking to achieve goodwill. And by goodwill, we're talking about something that goes even beyond your reputation. Um, and you develop goodwill, for example, for things like good service, um, good value for money, quality, etc. And the importance of goodwill is that when you've achieved it, it helps to build long-term sustainability in the marketplace. And that in turn leads to helping you to retain your market position. So if you consider market leaders, for example, Apple, um, Apple has achieved substantial goodwill in the marketplace, primarily based on its innovation and design. And because of that, it's been able to achieve many things, but including the maintenance of its position as market leader. So you're investing in developing your brand fundamentally to achieve goodwill. And you want to achieve goodwill because you want your business to grow and to be sustainable. So, what we're looking at today is essentially the legal protection available for your brand. And the primary form of legal protection we'll be considering would be in the form of intellectual property rights. And I know you would have probably heard quite a bit over the past decade or so um, on intellectual property as it becomes more relevant in terms of international trade, etc. But what do we mean? We're talking about the legal protection given to persons over the creations of their minds. And usually these are exclusive rights and they're granted for a specific period of time. These are actually forms of property. So the only difference is that they're intangible in nature. So the same way a car or a house are forms of property and can be transferred, sold, given away, used as collateral, etc. So to our intellectual property rights or APRs. Importantly, there are business assets and they can be valued and presented on your balance sheet. Now, because these rights are legal and they're exclusive, they have a very specific value um, because exclusivity means that others cannot use those rights and therefore they offer the possibility of limiting competitors in the marketplace, uh, at least for the period of time for which they've been granted, which means that you, in theory, you're in the marketplace um, and you're able to offer the protective products or services exclusively, keeping competitors out and thereby gaining a competitive advantage. And I'll give an example of that a little later on. So, as I mentioned, these rights um, offer significant value to businesses. And in addition to the benefits I previously mentioned, they um, play an important role in terms of the promotion of innovation 
And often you will hear people speak of intellectual property and innovation in the same breath. Because when creators and inventors invest the time and energy to create, you know, bring to market something new, they need the incentive in terms of knowing that, um, you know, other people will not have a free ride off of their time and money spent investing in it and that they'll be able to make a commercial return. And, and in that way, it serves intellectual property rights serve to promote innovation. And of course, um, through this innovative activity, the business or the inventor creator able to generate revenue. So as I've mentioned before, and this graphic just brings everything together. So on the one hand, you have the investor or creators um, who are busy developing new products, services, devices, processes. And you have competitors who are always waiting for new products and services to hit the market so they can take advantage and offer something similar or identical at a cheaper price. And they can do it at a cheaper price because they did not spend the time and energy investing in research and development. And if they're allowed to carry out that kind of activity which gives them an unfair advantage, in effect, it can push investors slash creators out um, by their ability to offer lower prices. So the intellectual property system essentially seeks to eliminate that unfair um, advantage. There are actually quite a few forms of intellectual property rights, and I mentioned a few here. We cannot look at all in the time allocated today. Um, we have patents which are rights granted for technical inventions, copyright, which is granted for literary and artistic works, geographical indication, which I'll click on, industrial designs, and trademarks. So those three, geographical indications, industrial designs, trademarks, those are what I'll focus on today. And what we need to understand is the intersection between these rights and brand. And these rights essentially speak to the elements of your brand which are legally protectable. So the subject of today's um, presentation is just this intersection. <clears throat> So first we will look at trademarks. What are trademarks? Trademarks are used to distinguish the products or services of one entity from another or from your competitor in the marketplace. And the brand of a trademark provides the owner of the right, exclusive rights on a territorial basis, which means if you're granted a trademark in Barbados, it is um, granting you exclusive rights in Barbados alone. If you want to also have your trademark registered and protected in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, you would need to register it in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to have those exclusive rights in that territory. Additionally, these rights are granted based on classes. There's an international classification system called the NIST classification system. I've provided a hyperlink. And what does this mean? It means that if you register a trademark in, in, in the class for, let's say, T-shirts, you do not have rights in the, trade, in the same trademark for you, say, in alcoholic beverages. So if you're thinking about registering a trademark, I'm going to give examples. 
you need to think of the territories of interest and you also need to consider the classes of interest in, in which you would want to play the treatment. Uh, one of the biggest benefits for me in terms of trademarks is that they're registered usually initially for 10 years, but you can, in theory, uh, renew the registration indefinitely. You have to be careful though, because the trademark has to be capable of distinguishing. So it cannot be a generic term. So what happens, um, for example, if, if, let's say Kleenex. Kleenex is a registered trademark, but it, care has to be taken that it is not treated as a generic term for facial tissues, because in, in normal you know, conversation, people will say, I would like a Kleenex. You're not necessarily going to say they want a facial tissue. So the term has become so popular for a category of goods that it becomes generic. In that case, it cannot be a registered trademark. So what constitutes a trademark? It can be a name, including personas, it can be a word, it can be a phrase, um, like Nike, you know, just do it. Um, it can be a design, it can be a number, it can be letters, and it can also be the shape of goods or their packaging, a sign or a logo. And I've given you the example here of Gucci, but of course, there are many trademarks in the Caribbean as well. Um, for example, locally we have Chefette, um, we have Automotive Arts, we have many companies that have um, trademarks. I'm not sure if they're all registered, but they serve the purpose of distinguishing the entity or its goods and services from that of another. Right. So what a trademark is not is a business name. So sometimes people think by going and registering a business name, um, which they then apply to their goods and services and use like a trademark, that by having the business name registration, they automatically have rights in, trade, in the trademark. No, they're not the same. The business name is simply a registration for the name to be used uh, for the business. A trademark is also not the same as a domain name registration. So let's go back to say Shafat. Um, Shafat, you may have Shafat Inc. You may then have the trademark Shafat, but then you may have a URL www.shafat.com. And each of these are different with different rights. And often, with some exceptions, trademarks are registered on a first come, first served basis. So you want to um, consider your trademark when you're developing your business plan or as part of your strategic planning generally. Um, you don't want to wait you know, too long to do your registration. So you have to consider, as I said, the territories, the classes. Um, of course, there is a cost involved. Um, and since it's on a territorial basis, you have to look at the cost based on the number of territories, et cetera. But importantly, you need to consider this uh, proactively um, in terms of your strategic plan and your business plan. Now, there is uh specific use of trademarks it, it goes a bit beyond trademarks to something called get up or trade drugs and this is where you look at the overall appearance of your product um your design your interior design your decor etc 
so that these are so um, recognizable that consumers can recognize, oh, well, that's that business, that is McDonald's, that is KFC, that is Starbucks. Um, and they're often, by a trademark law, there's protection for that overall look. And increasingly, this is becoming a technique in branding. And an example, the example I give here is with uh, the Tiffany box. And this overall, the overall appearance here is protected. You have the color, which is a specific color used by Tiffany. And usually if you know Tiffany products, once you see that color, you will know it's Tiffany. The accent bowl, the, um, the, the, the box itself, and of course the name Tiffany. All of these are protectable elements and this overall look is protectable as tree dress. So that's just taking the concept a little further. And as I said, it's particularly popular with, um, for example, fast food chain. So that look of McDonald's, which in theory, they look the same or similar wherever you go in the world, and it is instantly recognizable. So moving on, we will now look at another form of intellectual property right, which I think is particularly particularly relevant for the region, and these are industrial designs. Um, in the US, they're called design patents. So here we are looking or considering the, the aesthetics of the product, how it looks. And if you think about it, the look of products is becoming um, increasingly important competitive element. And I mentioned Apple before, and it listed some um, brands here which are known for their design, um, BMW, most car brands, of course. Um, you have Eames in terms of furniture, and more recently you have the Geek Airplane. But all of these are um, entities that have built a competitive position based on design. So, as I just mentioned, this is an area companies are increasingly focusing on, and it's a way of differentiating your product in the marketplace and building brand loyalty. Um, regionally, unfortunately, for, for some reason, design hasn't been an area that many companies have looked at. And um, certainly here in Barbados, you will often hear complaints about things like packaging, etc. But I must say that um, these have been improving, and I think it's just this awareness that consumers are placing more and more importance on your design. So designs are protectable under intellectual property law as industrial designs, and I've taken the definition from the Barbados I think this is the Barbados um, Industrial Designs Act. Um, if it isn't Barbados, it's definitely probably Grenada or one of the islands. But anyway, they're all very similar and it states an industrial design is A, any composition of lines or colors, or B, any three-dimensional form, whether or not associated with lines or colors, that gives a special appearance to the product of industry, or handicraft and serves as a pattern for a product of industry or handicraft. So, so what does that mean? Um, it can cover everything. You can use industrial design protection for everything from car design, furniture design, 
to textile design. And of course, you have fashion design. So the application of industrial design rights are quite broad. Um, as with trademarks, you're being granted exclusive rights. And again, this is where you're gaining a lot of value. And the exclusive rights will generally prevent the unauthorized copying of the design or importing often for sale, etc. cetera, um, any products which bear the protected design. Um, protection is normally for five years initially, and it can vary between 15 to 25 years. Um, one of the reasons why, for example, it's not heavily used in fashion design is because fashion changes very quickly. So you don't necessarily need protection for such a long period of time unless you're talking about very classic um, evergreen type designs. So again, in terms of your business planning, if you offer products that have a very innovative design, you want to carefully consider the pros and cons of going through the registration process. Um, you need to also bear in mind that the design has to be novel, it has to be completely new. And one of the precautions you should take is not to expose your design to others until you have determined um, you know, whether or not you will go through the registration process. So as I mentioned, um, industrial designs offer protection for a wide range of products, jewelry, fashion, furniture, household items, vehicles, etc. Moving quickly along, we're going to look at the third form of um, intellectual property right uh, in terms of its value for branding. And these are geographical indications. Now these are a little different from trademarks and industrial designs. These are used for goods based on where they're coming from, the, the territory or region in which they're sourced. And because of where they're coming from, their source, they will have specific characteristics that, uh, in which, sorry, specific characteristics which provide them with specific value. And often they are traditional products using traditional methods. Um, an example, an easy example, um, is in the graphic you saw before. Here, so we have, for example, it's not a GA, but a registered GA, but we have West Indies GA in our company. We have um, Jamaica Jerk. Internationally, better known would be Champagne. We have Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey. These are all um, examples of products. Uh, which are sourced from specific regions and have specific qualities or characteristics because of their origin. Uh, they don't always, the GI doesn't, so champagne is a geographical indication and it speaks to sparkling wine from the champagne region in France, but they do not always have geographical names, and I give the example of feta cheese. Um, like other forms of intellectual property, they will grant authorized users the exclusive right to use the GA on the relevant product or products. Unlike, say, trademarks and design, the owner, the owners of the GA is not an individual. 
So for example, in Jamaica, they recently registered Jamaica Dirt. What did that entail? It entails, there are a number of steps, but you have an association, a producer's association established. You have to identify the specific region from which the products must be sourced. Um, if there are specific production techniques that have to be followed, those need to be documented. You have to have your regulations, your rules and regulations. And then there's an authorization process which will allow producers from within that territory to apply the GA. And um, the holder of the rights. So in the case of Jamaica Jerk, the association can prohibit the false representation of the goods to which the GA is affixed originally in a geographical area other than the state of origin. So, um, although they're a little different, GIs can play a very important role in terms of the identification of goods based on territory and specific characteristics. And, um, as I will show you in an example later on, they can be used along with other forms of intellectual property. So you can have, uh, let's say, a, a sparkling wine identified as champagne. So it will bear the GA, the logo, whatever, champagne. But, um, the individual producer will then also have their own trademark so that you can identify, yes, this is champagne, but it comes from this specific producer. So you can, what I'm getting to is the fact that you can have multiple, you can apply multiple forms of intellectual property rights to your goods or services. Um, GIs also prevent unfair competition. So where um, competitors are trying to create confusion in the marketplace, um, it could also be where false allegations are made to discredit the business. And any action to which seeks to mislead the public as to, for example, the manufacturing process involved. And here I've given an example with um, Dominica Vera um, as a possible GA. So this image serves to reinforce what I was saying in terms of there are many forms of IP and you can actually use multiple um, forms in one product. And I've given the example of Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola, there is a patent in the cap, um, or was, I don't know if it still exists, and I'll explain. Um, you can have trademark, the trademark in terms of the logo. You can also have copyright, which we didn't discuss today, um, but remember I said copyright subsist in literary and artistic work. So the text can be treated, uh, can be protected under copyright. Uh, remember I spoke about trade dress or get up, which is the overall look. And they mentioned here design patent. Remember I said in the US, industrial designs are called design patents. So the, the bottle shape can be protected in turn, as trade dress or um, and or under industrial designs. And then what I didn't discuss today would be trade secrets. Now, trade secrets are not intellectual property rights per se, but they are applied similarly and offer some protection. So, I know that I did not have a lot of time um, and I will 
tweet a little um, Gail or Randy, you can tell me if they have a, a couple minutes just to tweet um, in terms of trade secrets. So a lot of Caribbean SMEs are involved in the development of recipes. And the importance here is how would you protect your recipe? You're building your brand based on having a fantastic formula. And one form of protection would be a trade secret. So unlike intellectual property rights, you're not registering your trade secret anywhere. You're just maintaining secrecy. And you see there are popular examples internationally the same Coca-Cola, its recipe is a trade secret. KFC has a trade secret. And um, for your, you know, it could be your pepper sauce or whatever, you also use trade secrets as a form of protection. Um, once you're able to maintain the secret, you can have protection indefinitely. So we looked earlier, I mentioned earlier on what the value of intellectual property rights are for brands and, and where they intersect. So just to review, intellectual property rights offer exclusivity. They allow for you to block competitors or at least to make it more difficult to enter the marketplace. They allow for protection from unfair competition. They allow for premium pricing. And a, an example of this would be, say, with uh, Viagra. So Viagra is uh, a, te a technical invention. Therefore, it's protected um, with a patent. And when you have a patent, again, you have exclusive rights for more or less 20 years. And during that period, only you can put uh, products on the market with the protected invention. So Viagra in theory had 20 years of exclusivity. Um, and because of that, they were able to charge a much higher price. Again, looking at this idea of having multiple forms of protection, um, they would have also developed the trademark Viagra. And during that 20 years, they were able to charge premium prices, keep competitors out of the market, but also to build awareness of the name Viagra. They also created it as a, a blue pill. So it, the color is also a trademark. So they had the patent protection and they had the trademark protection. After the 20 years, so when the patent protection expired, they had built up a very strong trademark. It was distinctive, it was well known with consumers, so that when competitors like Cialis and others then entered the market, as generic, um, Viagra was still able to maintain its market leadership because it had built a strong brand using its patent and trademark. And it will be able to continue to benefit from the trademark protection long after the patent has expired because as I told you, you can in theory renew your trademark indefinitely. Um, as I mentioned, these are business assets and you are able to license them, them and to use them to expand your market. So as you know, um, again, use, I'm sorry to use it again, but KFC. So KFC has been able to expand globally through the uh, franchising system. And essentially that is built on the licensing of your trademark. So 
if you're going to, if you're thinking, well, I would like to develop my business one day. I have, you know, barber shops or something. I want to develop them one day so that I can um, offer that the brand as a franchise. Essentially, you're talking about licensing your trademark. So I also mentioned that these are assets which have actual value and they are shown on, or can be shown on your balance sheet once they've been valued. So your business enterprise value, your overall business value would comprise your working capital, your fixed assets, your intangible assets plus your intellectual property. No, intellectual property rights are a form of intangible assets but but we're talking about rights that are actually registered so um i didn't have enough time to go into the murray sharp case but i'll summarize it quickly and advise you that the full case study is available on the Caribbean Export website. But this is a regional case study which looks at um, brand development and pitfalls that can be experienced. This is a Belizean company, very well known for its pepper sauce. And the case study looks at the challenges they faced where after developing some reputation in the marketplace and actually expanding beyond beliefs into the US with some success, um, they ran into a major problem because they had not registered a trademark in the US. And in fact, the distributor they were using registered it. I remember first come, first serve. So the distributor registered the trademark in the US and owned the rights to the trademark there, not Marie Sharp. And eventually that it led to them having to change the trademark. So it actually, Marie Sharp started as Melinda's. And because they lost the trademark rights in the US, they had to go through a whole rebranding exercise and come up with a new name. And even when they'd done that and, and got a new logo and everything, they then had a potential problem with Tabasco because the logo they had, their initial redesigned logo, um, Tabasco thought it infringed theirs. So the case looked at the, these challenges and the company faced, which actually cost them more than a quarter million US to rectify. Um, because it's pepper sauce, they also rely heavily on trade secrets. And of course, they had an unfortunate experience in that regard as well, where even though they had taken steps to protect their trade secret, and I would really urge those of you in businesses which would have a particular interest in trade secrets to read the case because it informs you about the infrastructure they develop in order to maintain secrecy and how even after taking all of those precautions, they still had some challenges. So I would advise you to read the case. Um, you know, a lot of times people do not think about intellectual property rights proactively but they do arise in many situations which you may never think of. So if you're going to do a distribution agreement, an agency agreement, you have to consider the intellectual property aspects. And the other thing I would say is as you go about developing your brand, you have to, besides having an understanding of what the brand is, what it represents, etc to identify the, the elements which can be protected. And then as part of your business plan, figure out how and if you will make the investment to protect those elements. So your trademark, 
um, if you're depending on design your design like I said even though um, you're not trade secrets are not an IPR or such you, you need to consider the use of secrecy um, and increasing in the Caribbean there's been a lot of work done in terms of uh, how we can better use geographical indications to create value. So all of these you have to consider within your business planning. And as I mentioned, there are actually more forms of IP which we didn't consider. So you would probably need to also explore, you know, if you have technical inventions, etc., these other forms of protection. Um, so I want to thank you. Um, I, will, I will take questions now. Um, and I invite you, if you want, you can visit the um, i-manageintellect.com website. And there, there's an IP assessment you can also carry out. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Erica, for that very interesting and um, enlightening session. I know we have several questions, so in the interest of time, I won't elaborate on anything. You've done a very good summary. So we can open, uh, I'll now open the floor to the question and answer session. And I will start with the first one that we had which was with from Reggie and the question was what are the best practices in protecting your source code as an IP okay so in terms of source code we're talking about uh, copyright protection and copyright which I didn't look at unlike say trademarks is not um, something that you have to register for the right to subsist. So once it's original and it can be classified as a literary work, which the source code would be, um, you would have protection under copyright. Now, the thing is, um, and it's a bit of a worry to most people as well. If I'm not registering it somewhere, how, how do I guarantee protection? Well, you need to make sure it's documented. And, you know, people scoff, but you can put it on a, in an envelope and register mail it to yourself. And the protection there is that it will be dated. And if you have to provide evidence um, you can, you know, have the court um, break that seal, look at the date, and the, the question would be who had it first. But um, in some countries like Jamaica, there's a registration process. And of course, most people, a lot of people in the Caribbean will register with the Library of Congress in the US. So you can register. Um, to have some protection, but um, you're going to be looking at copyright. And, uh -huh. and it will have automatic, it will, once, it, once it's uh, original, it will subsist automatically. You want to add something, Wendy? No, I thought you had um, you had paused, so I thought you had actually um, would have stopped answering that question. So we have another question, and this is from Sumai, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, does IP extend to mobile app IDs? Um, knowing that IP doesn't really protect IDs, but I think we get the gist of the question. Yeah, so again, we're going to be looking primarily at copyright for protection. And um, it's about documenting your work. Um, like I said, there, there's no, 
you don't have to register. You, 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 there's nothing that says you have to register to gain some copyright protection, but you can register the work to have some peace of mind. But apps are going to be copyright. Yeah. Okay, this one is from Daniel Knight. And how does one go about registering a trademark in your local jurisdiction? And must this be done before going regionally? All right, so ideally you want to ensure you're registered in your primary market or markets. Regionally, you, you go to your intellectual property office in Barbados, that would be Kaito. But each island has an, uh, an intellectual property office. And normally you will have to complete a form. Like I said, you have to be aware of the cost of registration. There's a whole process. Um, so you apply, you, you have to do a search. So, so importantly, I didn't mention this. Um, let's say you're not starting out and you have to think through a logo or whatever you don't want to make that investment and then find out when you go to register that it's already taken or that it's too close to a pre-existing trademark and you will not be allowed to register it. So you want to do a search and you can do this at your local um, IPO or and or you can also do it online at the World Intellectual Property WIPO WIPO dot a n t they have a brand database where you can actually um search for uh brands internationally trademarks internationally and see what has already been taken but um i would advise you to just go to your local intellectual property office and they will tell you the process and you you, you may be advised to um, hire an, an attorney to help you with it. Thank you, Erica. Um, the next question we have is from Prudence Rowe, and this one is Brandon, um, just indicating that Brandon is very important um, to her, especially as a new business in the market. How can I protect my intellectual property as a service business um, as discussions with attorneys and other business persons have advised that as a service business, it cannot be patented or receive a trademark. Um, so basically, how can you assist in, in, in giving any kind of direction as to how she can go about um, registering, uh, protecting those aspects of a service business? Right. So I'm not sure why you wouldn't be able to get a trademark. Um, the, the trademark is essentially the, the name or sign or whatever you use to distinguish your service. So um, if you're, if, if you have, a, like this is IMS, um, you can register that under a class for the provision of consultancy services. I, I'm not sure why you would be told you couldn't get a trademark, but I would think you can. So in the first instance, definitely as a service provider, you're going to be looking at trademark protection. There may be other areas. So for example, um, you may have copyright. I, I don't know the sector you're operating in, but you may have copyright protection in if you if you do pamphlets, if you do website design, they're they're, they're possible forms of IP that would apply to you even though you are in the service sector. Um, I, I don't know if you want to, you can follow up with Wendy or myself after to, to, if you want to give more specific information. Okay, Erica, so this one now is um, an IT related question. This one is coming from Gideon, think Augustine um, as an IT company who wants to register its logo um, 
slash trademark mm -hmm. uh, for both regional and international commerce, what classes would I need to consider for inclusion when registering my trademark? Uh, I, I I don't know the classes uh, offhand. Um, you would have to go to the NICE system. Um, again, if you go to WIPO.INT, NICE, and ICE, um, they, they list the, the classes, but honestly, I don't know them offhand. So, um, first, you, you would look at the classes and see which apply. But the question of international, um, there is a, an international system which facilitates trademark applications globally, um, at least within the countries that participate in that system. Unfortunately, in the Caribbean, it's only Antigua. So it means that you have to register in each of the, uh, if you're a Barbadian, um, a Barbadian entity, you will need to register in each of the territories of interest. Um, and as I said, I would start with those in which you are most active. So we have, we actually have quite a number of questions. So um, the organizers have given us permission to go on until 12, um, 1.30. Okay. Uh, we'll just continue. If you don't mind, you can take a sip of water. <laughs> but um, the next question is from Alberta, and this question is, are there geographical indicators around a service? <laughs> um, I laugh because um, Wendy and I have been theorizing on that. Uh, unfortunately, the, most legislations will specify products. Um, I think when it's Croatia, that they're, Croatia. They're, yes, they're, yeah, they're very few that will speak to services, and certainly in the Caribbean, um, legislation speaks to products. Okay, I, I guess we can add to that to Erica that they um, there is now starting to be an international discussion around the protection of um, services on the geographical indications and you know so we you know it'd be a good idea for us to actually start to engage ourselves in that um, international dialogue as early as possible considering that so many of our um, entrepreneurs are actually within that within that particular sector yeah but I'm, I am curious uh, you know it can be offline um, the, the service that you think would be, you know, relevant as a GI, to have GI protection. So I, I don't know who the uh, participant was, but um, certainly it would be interesting to learn more about that. Okay, we've, um, we've made a note of the, um, the participant who asked the question. Okay. Um, the next one is from Tricia Beckles, and um, considering CSMEs, uh, what are some of the costs involved, I suppose, in terms of registration of the, the IP assets? Right, it can be, um, honestly, it can be costly dependent on the type of intellectual property, right? So I think in Barbados for one class, I think start at $75. Um, if you're looking at patents, it can be a lot more expensive. But going back to trademarks, you're looking at the application costs, you could be looking at search costs, you look at the publication costs because there's a process where your um, your application is published so that if someone wants to object to the um, registration, they're notified, normally through the National Defense. So you have publication costs. Um, if you have an attorney, an agent, their costs, so it can stack up. 
um, but the, the, the cost will depend on the form of the intellectual property. Um, having said that, um, I just want to emphasize that they can be controlled. Um, I think it's important as I keep re reiterating to uh, think about these things in your business plan and, and plan for them in a strategic manner. So when you look at the Mar Mary Sharp case study, a lot of their costs arose because they had um, made some mistakes and it wasn't, they didn't go about it in a planned manner. Um, designs, industrial designs are not expensive, generally, unless you have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of designs to register, but um, they, they can be managed. So I don't want to scare you off. Um, you can afford to register your trademark, um, at least in a couple of territories generally, and you can afford to register your designs. Um, Geographical indications are, dealt with, are, are done differently, and in most of our territories, as far as I'm aware, other than the cost involved in terms of defining the technical specifications and so on, there isn't a registration cost. And copyright, as I said, once it's an original literary or artistic work, um, the rights subsist of it. Okay, thanks, Harry Pat. So now we have another question by Alberta, and uh, who wanted a clarification um, with your Coca-Cola example? So just to clarify, is the IP with respect to Coca-Cola is it in per, per, oh geez, perpetuity? With per, oh geez, I'm not even going to go there. My tongue is just being tied up there. Example: um, Do they have to renew? And that is perpetuity. <laughs> Do they have, sorry? Do they, they have, have to have the right to forever? Um, they just wanted to know if the, the, the IP that you mentioned or you referred to with regard to Coca-Cola, and I know there are several that you referred to, um, if they have them, if they have to renew them or they've now at the point where they don't need to go through that process as well. Right, so when I showed the slide, um, I think it started with uh, a, a utility patent for the cap. And I did say would come back to it because chances are that protection no longer exists because um, you're given patent protection for a specified period of time. So even if they came up with a unique um, locking system for their cap, um, after the 20 years or 10 years or whatever, the um, protection would expire. Um, now, what they can hold on to uh, potentially forever would be the trademark. So they would still need to keep renewing that trademark and the trade secret in the recipe. Um, as long as they can maintain that secret, um, again, let's be clear, trade secrets are not intellectual property rights as such, but akin to, similar to. So in theory, they can maintain the secret forever. And just that saying, why would you use trade secret um, when in fact, often in place of the trade secret, you can have a patent but if the if coca-cola had gone with patent protection for its formula for its drink formula um after 20 years it would be a free-for-all because then what what happens is you're granted an exclusive right for a period of time during which you can charge premium pricing you can establish yourself in the market etc but Essentially, it's an exchange. Government says, we will give you this exclusivity, but you have to disclose your invention. You have to disclose your invention sufficiently so that another person in your field is able to reproduce it. And that disclosure is important because 
it allows for the advancement of knowledge. Um, if if Henry Ford wasn't didn't have to let's say disclose the uh, how his invention for the automobile engine worked, um, it may have taken a lot longer for others to come on the market and understand how it works and, and for competition to enter the market. So it was a strategic decision. You can register the patent, apply for a patent, disclose the invention, and know that after your 20 years, competitors can just take your disclosure and reproduce it. Or as Coca-Cola decided, well, you know what? We don't want to disclose. We will rely on trade secret trade secrecy and try to keep this as secret as for as long as possible to maintain the competitive advantage and that is usually the route you would go with the recipe which is why kfc would have uh, their secret herbs and spices and did not go the route of having patent protection so in the example i give with coca-cola the reason you would rely on multiple forms of protection is because some, such as your design or patent, will expire after a period of time. And you could uh, seek to address that through continuous innovation so that you continuously improve and bring out new, tech, um, you know, new designs, et cetera, and, and, and seek new forms of protection, which certainly Coca Cola does. But you also know that you can rely potentially forever on the trademark and trade secret. So I, I hope I clarify. Thank you. Um, our next question deals with um, valuing of IP assets. So how is a trademark or any other IP valued on the balance sheet? <laughs> You, you need to bring an evaluation specialist. <laughs> um, but it's true. Um, valuation is a specific skill, and you would need to have um, a valuation expert who can. There are various techniques um, where they look at comparables, replacement value, etc. But the point is, you will need to have someone who specialises in IP valuation. Um, there really aren't many specialists regionally. It's something that is very, very new, not only to the Caribbean, but to many territories. Um, so it's not a skill set that's highly developed in the region, but you would need to have um, a specialist. And the few cases I'm aware of where, where it's come up in the region, it's usually been with the bigger companies when they're merging or being sold and the, their, their trademarks and so on have to be valued. Okay, so on the next two questions um, deal with um, trade secrets, so I'll combine them. Um, and these are from Sharo and from Delay. One is asking for more details on trade secrets in terms of things like cosmetic formula. And mm -hmm. the other one is how do you protect a trade secret? if you're thinking of mass production using an outsourced bottling company. Right, all right, Let, let's take the last one first. So mm -hmm. if you're outsourcing, uh, automatically you're going to have to think about prepackaging your formulae and, and sending them out. You, you cannot maintain a trade secret um, by exposing it to potentially many other people. So even with Coca-Cola, um, they're, they're, they're going to send the prepackaged um, ingredients. So that is what you'll have to think of. Uh, in the first question, I'm sorry, um, it was um, how do you protect it? How do you maintain it? Yeah, in terms of um, the, the example here was called cosmetic formula, but I think is um, the person is just wanting a little bit more detail in, um, in terms of trade secrets. And I know we have, we've had several trade secret type questions, so I'm sure you, you have covered that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. All right, 
So, first of all, read the Mary Sharp case. Um, in terms of your process and your manufacturing process, uh, there are techniques entities use so you can break it up. So, in the case of Mary Sharp, they um, do not allow all of their employees to be exposed to the full manufacturing process or to know the recipes or the formula used. So they break it up. And I think of the eight employees they had at the time, only three knew the full formula and process. So you want to think of how they structure my processing so that um, knowledge to the, the overall system is limited. You also want to use um, confidentiality agreements with all employees. Um, you know, this is not 100% foolproof, but it will help in terms of the maintenance of secrecy. Um, and, you know, companies will do things such as ensure all your formulae are documented and stored in a vault or in a safety deposit box or something like that. So, on a basic level, you want to limit the level of exposure to the formulae and to the processing. Okay, I think we can add to that too, when you're dealing with employees, um, certainly you have, um, in addition to having an exit strategy with them where they, or an exit interview, clearly when they start, you have an interview with them and discuss, you know, yeah. what are these and don'ts in relation to your um, trade secrets. Yeah. Our next question is from um, Zarel Gittins, and it says that as an aspiring entrepreneur that wishes to offer a product that has never been offered in their country in a bid to protect the that product slash i sorry or the idea related to it from being replicated or stolen from other companies can a person file an application for any form of intellectual property rights themselves or do they absolutely need to hire an ip attorney for that um, it depends. You don't always need an attorney, but I'll tell you, if it's a patent, you definitely need the expertise. Um, the, the patent process can be very complicated, and I would advise very strongly you go to a specialist. Um, I know in the region, there are lots of concerns about things like exposure in business plans, etc. Um, you can provide your own confidentiality agreement. But, you know, if you're going to a reputable attorney, um, I think you should feel fairly secure that they're going to maintain confidentiality. Okay, so the next set of questions, Gail will um, field those questions for you. Well, not field them, but she'll, she'll take over the, the questions. Okay. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Erica. Um, we have a whole heap of questions here. So we are going through, and some will answer directly. Some we honestly might not get to. Right now, mm -hmm. we had planned to go on 1.30, but I think we might shoot now for 2 o'clock. Um, Erica will try to answer as many questions as possible. She'll keep her answers short and sweet, <laughs> and we'll try to get to all your questions. Okay. okay, so this question is from Roy Wiesenhagen. If you develop a branded social concept for a mun municipality, city, and if it be in use for several years, however, there is no registration of the concept, who owns the rights? Me as a developer or the city? Um, but my, my first question would be to understand if it was commissioned, if there, there was no contract. Um, there, there are a number of questions that will have to be asked to better understand. But I missed a key part, Gail. You, you said a social concept? Yes, a branded social concept. Right. So I need to better understand what that is um, and the rights that would be involved. 
I would need to know if it was a case where it was commissioned, if there was any sort of contract that would have spoken to the transfer of rights. Um, I can't I can't give a definitive answer based on the information provided. But the um, you you can send an email and um, we can discuss it offline. Not a problem. Okay, thank you. Um this question actually comes from my colleague, Safia Reed in Haiti. Hi, Safia. Um, and actually, Debbie Strawn, who you're also familiar with from the Bahamas, hers is kind of similar to this, so I will try and combine them. What are some examples, protectable elements of traditional handicraft, such as jewelry and other types of art? And combined with that, Debbie wanted to know if their straw handicraft in the Bahamas can be protected as a GA. Um, so first of all, normally when you talk about jewelry and, and fashion pieces, etc., you would be thinking in terms of industrial design. But as I said, these have to be new. So we are talking about traditional design. Uh, in the case of the Bahamas and your straw craft, traditional technique. Um, yes, I think there's a strong case to be made based on what I know of it for a GA to be developed and have a GI system surrounding that. And I think, in fact, that was a previous recommendation. Um, and then you can, the individual producer can have trademark protection as well. So the, the, the straw craft, the Bahamian straw craft can be protected by GI and then you as the individual producer can have your own trade. Okay. Thank you. Um, Gilbert Joseph asks, what are the things that are a must? No two ways about it. To do or have IPRs. So what in your business should you be protected? Should should be a no-brainer. Your 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 name, the, the name you're trading on this, so your trademark. And um, I guess you will probably most most businesses have some form of copyright in terms of whether it's booklets, website, content, photos, etc. Those are the two in terms of Caribbean businesses um, that I think would probably apply to most businesses. Okay, thank you. Maria Sherry asks, and this is quite relevant now today, in an educational context and with the increased use of social media to deliver teaching content in the COVID-19 environment, to what extent should one be concerned about the trademark items in the background of multimedia resources? Right, so, hi Maria. Um, trademarks are protected IP, yeah. Um, in terms of teaching where you may just have something in passing in the background, um, I, I think you could get away with it. But if they come here and it's prominent and it's on display for a long period of time, I would suggest that you blur, um, blur out any registered trademarks. Okay, thank you. Another question from Debbie in the Bahamas. Patent mm -hmm. protection extends for how many years and can it be renewed? Normally for 20 years. Um, it can be extended if you add to it, if there's further innovation that would allow for further protection. But generally it's 20 years. In most countries it's 20 years. Okay. I, I can't say definitively for the Bahamas, but in most countries it's for 20 years and then there are some variations. Okay, thank you. Evans Ayers asks, at the common law level, would emailing your trademark, copyright, et cetera, to another email address owned by self be recognized? I think this question, from what I understand, is relevant to copyright, but not the others, but you can you can respond to that. Hey, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Emailing them to yourself? I think it, 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 it's, 
it's to do with i think he's he's getting a little bit mixed up you know in order to register your copyright to register when it was recorded you can postmark something and even and, well it would have to be mail not email um i think that's where where his question is going um honestly this question in terms of copyright and mailing to yourself uh, and the question of whether you can do it by email um, as proof. I can't answer that definitively. It, it came up in another forum. I tend to think that with the fact of having a date that you would have some form of evidence of it existing. Um, and, and that's the most I would say on that. Okay, thank you. I, Debbie? I'm, I'm not sure, like you said, maybe it's a, a misunderstanding in terms of the trademark and patent. But for copyright, I'll leave my response as stated. Okay, thank you. Debbie Eswick would like to seek an advice on how brands and individual collaborators might deal with IP when collaborating on open innovation projects? Yeah, um, no, it's the use of the word open um, because it, when you do open innovation, um, normally the understanding is that you're it's open, you're not seeking to enforce the rights, etc. So I'm not sure I understand the question when you say open innovation, but where you're working collaboratively generally um, and the work will be protected and exploited uh, using the IP system, you should have a collaboration agreement upfront stating how you will um, share rights and ownership, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Renee Robinson asks, should screen-based content, feature films, short films, TV episodes, animated content, etc., get an ISAN number as well as copyright in your local IP offices? And she wants to know the pros and cons. Uh, I don't know that you can get an ISAN number um, in the local IPO. ADV, if you will have to go online and obtain it online. Um, for sure here in Barbados, no, I'm not sure about Jaipo. She said, um, I saw a number of what? What was the other? As well as copyright in the local IP offices. Right. So, Rene, as I mentioned, um, you don't, in Jamaica, you can register um, your copyright. And, and that's solely to have it registered, but that would not, that is not necessary for the grant of copyright. So the the AV work would have copyright as long as it's original. But in terms of registration, you can register it for archival and other purposes, but not isn't necessary to have copyright. Okay, thank you. Ade Ennis King would like to know what are some effective mechanisms that you can use to prevent IP theft when submitting technical service proposals to government ministries? Right. Um, in the first instance, the, the, the agency should be proactively providing you with confidentiality agreement. Um, you should, prior to submission, see, ask them up front for what, you know, their, their policies, their confidentiality policies, etc. And you can even have, if, if they're authorized, have them sign off on a confidentiality agreement. But I would start by seeking their policy and asking them for a confidentiality agreement. Okay, so this segues into a question from Agnes Francis. She's now speaking about the marketing industry where you may pitch a campaign or another idea to a company how can you protect against a company using that idea? Same thing. All of these, I would say, before you provide another entity with, with your concept or content, um, you should seek to have a confidentiality agreement. And 
you should also ensure that you have your work properly documented and dated and so on. You can do the form on copyright and send a copy to your self-registered mail or, you know, give a copy to your attorney. Um, have it both ways. Just um, before you provide a copy to another party, so at least you can show that it existed at such and such a date and it goes some ways in proving that you are um, can be presumed to be the right so um, you should also as you develop different drafts and, and develop your work keep copies of all of those as well so that at least you can prove in some way that this is your work Thank you. So Philichar from St. Kitts and Nevis asks, if you register trademark with a name or design and a different class, would there be a conflict or would the mark be registered? All right, let's take the question one more time. If you register, <laughs> say, say it again. If, if you register a trademark, a name yeah. or design under a different class, I guess if you register it in two classes, would there if, be a conflict Conflict, or would the marks be registered? Or maybe yeah. if you register in one and not the other? No, um, no, no I, I don't think I understand the question clearly, but if you, let's say it's Gail and I, and she registers in one class and they register in another class, then there shouldn't be an issue. That's, okay. that's the best they can understand that. Yes, I, I think that's all we might have for that right now. Um, Alex, can I just add to so, that? Um, just to say that um, as long as, I mean, another layer on that would be as long as it does not cause confusion, because sometimes even though the classes might be different, in the consumer's mind, they're making that um, association. So it's left to the trademark examiners to make that particular um, determination. Thank you, Wendy. Delisle is also asking whether the likelihood, <laughs> that's why I will have to say, the likelihood, she's asking about whether, um, why doesn't CARICOM offer practical regional trademark options? Or why can't you have a regional trademark in <laughs> CARICOM? I'll leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I listen. Um, I don't know that I can answer that. I would definitely support uh, a regional system, such as what you have in the EU, EU for example, to, to better facilitate um, persons who are seeking protection. Um, right now, where you have to go through each item separately, I think is a turn off for a lot of people. So I support it. I also support um, us signing on to the international system, the Madrid Protocol. Um, in, in that situation, I'm told that um, there's a fear that the intellectual property offices will lose too much revenue. But um, I think we have to, as a region, determine our commitment to facilitating regional entrepreneurship and export growth um, by facilitating the use of the intellectual property system. Um, so I support it, but I can't tell you why, why it isn't there. Okay, and I think that also, we had another question from Julio Rias who asked if about the future of a regional um, IP office, but I think you covered that as well. And <laughs> Um, we all talk about it. Okay, Joshua, Joshua Arana asks, how would you address IP among indigenous cultures where we believe that traditional knowledge is passed on by our ancestors and as a result, music, dance, etc., belong to the community and not an individual? Right, so there's actually a lot of work going on. Um, there's no international consensus, no international system as yet but there is a lot of work going ongoing in terms of how do you what's the best way or ways of dealing with traditional knowledge 
from Porto and the Caribbean. I, I don't know where the participant is from, but the Caribbean, this is one area that we've been quite active in. So it's understood that communal ownership and knowledge um, should be treated differently in indigenous communities. And I can tell you that, at least for the Caribbean, we are actively involved in the international discussion. We, we haven't resolved it yet, but work is ongoing. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Sidoni Autar. How do you go about copywriting training manuals? What are some of the likely hurdles in getting this done? You, you don't go about copywriting. So again, um, unlike trademarks, designs, patents, there's no copywriting system. What it is, is for copyright, as long as your work can be classified as either a literary work or an artistic work, um, and in most countries, there's a requirement that it's documented in some format and its original copyright will subsist automatically. Um, when you hear of registration systems, it's, it's not that registration is a requirement for protection, but most of that your um, people are just looking for way of um, documenting or archiving their work or ensuring that they have some proof for evidentiary purposes you know, if they had to go to court. But you don't have to go about a process of copywriting. Okay, thank you. Okay, just to let everyone know, we have 10 more minutes. I know some people are leaving. As you mm -hmm. exit the seminar, please remember to, to complete the questionnaire. Um, Natalie Headley. Sorry, one, one thing I want to add though, um, to, to benefit from copyright protection, your work can be technical in nature. Um, it doesn't have to be some high level artistic or literary work. It can be fairly mundane work as long as it is original. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Natalie Headley would like to know, how does the trade related aspect of intellectual property trips ensure computer programs are given protection? Um, I, I believe on the trips, they specify that these are um, protected under copyright. So trips would spell out that these works are protectable under copyright. Okay. Thank you. I think. I think we're getting someone. Oh, someone just asked you to make a comment, Evan Ayers. Can you make a comment on service marks? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, I said trademark, and I probably should have said trade or service mark. So it's simply that trademarks apply to products and service marks apply to services. Essentially the same thing. Um, just the nature of the, of, of the thing that they're applied to. But service or trademark. It's just that one is used on products and one is used on services. That's all. Okay, I think we have three more questions. That's what I'm saying here. So we can um, just finish those up. From Portia Blackman, to follow on from the matter of your ideas or products being used, how does one protect your product or service when there's a TV series of entrepreneurs pitching ideas and someone else who has the money brings your service product to market before you can after they saw your pitch on television. Right. So first of all, um, the, there are two things here. The, the pitch is made often within the context of a competition or something like that. So the Persons responsible for the competition should have their rules and regulations which speak to the ownership of IP, etc. Um, and I would advise that before you participate in any such program that you insist and you look very carefully at the rules and regulations. In terms of someone now who's viewing it and 
sees this and decides, you know what, I'm going to um, follow up on this. Um, to the extent that what you're pitching is something that's protectable, I would advise that you try and get the register for the protection in advance of uh, making it public. And this is really, really important because, as I said, in terms of industrial design, to have the protection, the design has to be new, completely novel. Again, with patents, you, you need to um, ensure that before you expose these things to the public, that you try and apply for the, 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 the registration. So, I wouldn't advise you say with something you know highly innovative to go on television in a pitch situation without first having sought protection. Okay, thank you. And this is our last question from what I can see. And I apologize profusely if I missed any, and I hope that Erica has covered um, your question. So this is from Joseph Peltier, and someone else had asked it earlier as well. How can I get intellectual property protection when my products are agriculture based and are available to anyone? I produce a blend of these products. They produce a blend of what products? Agricultural products. The products are agricultural based. And they produce um, a blend? It sounds like agro processing, something's agro processed to me. Okay, so if you're blending so that you have a specific formula or recipe, um, I would advise you to go to trade secret route. You can also, for your blend, apply a trademark. Um, I, without knowing any further details, there may be possibilities for protection through the GI system or through a right that I didn't mention at all which would be, I, I don't know the varieties and so on they're using because there's, there's, there's something called new plant variety protection as well, new plant variety rights. But based on what you said, I would think um, trade secrets and a trademark or trademarks for sure. Okay, thank you, Erica. I think we have covered all the questions and there were a lot thank you for your questions erica if you have or and or wendy wendy you can just if you have anything in closing that you would like to add no um i just wanted to say that i hope it was useful um i appreciate that there were a lot more questions than i anticipated but i hope that's an indication that you know it was useful and interesting um you can always uh, report. If you have any further questions offline, I'm happy. I'm happy to assist however I can. But I thank you, um, Caribbean Export and Wendy, the Caribbean Project, for giving me the opportunity. And I hope it was informative. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, for me, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody who has um, attended the session. It was really quite interesting to see the numbers. Um, and definitely, Erica, um, thanks for your for your presentation. And uh, as Gil mentioned, you know, the Curry P project is going to be run in the region for another, for about four years. And these are the topics that we will be addressing in the project. So there'll be more seminars. As a matter of fact, webinars. We're hoping to, you know, continue to collaborate with Gail and Sita uh, to run a few more um, webinars. So um, we'll be working with you certainly in, in a whole lot of different areas in the region when it comes to IP. Thank you, Wendy. And I just want to say on behalf of Caribbean Export, um, this was our first real collaboration with Creepy, and we've been talking for a while now. And so we would like to thank you for coming on board and we look forward to many more. Um, I would like to thank Erica for her informative um, session. We know that these could go on for hours and hours and hours and the questions don't stop, which give us hope. So as, as Erica and, and Wendy said, please, you can reach out to any of us. If you don't know how, go on, um, you can email Caribbean Export and we would get, I would get the questions to the relevant persons. Um, I also want to add, going through the questions that I saw in the 
in the question box. A lot of people do not seem to be aware of their local intellectual property offices. And I can tell you, these offices are a great resource in each country. And they, um, I think that is one of the resources that everyone should be using. Um, these countries, many, these offices many times do not have many staff members and are very, and are very stretched. But if you have intellectual property, that is who you need to be contacting in, in, in your country. So please, every, every country has a local IP office. So please contact your local IP office. I also wish to remind you of the webinar on Thursday, um, monetizing your intellectual property with Chris Doherty of Windward Commodities, who has done great work with the Barbados Sugar. And thank you again. Thank you for the attendees, for, for, your, for your interest. You're still here after two hours. Um, that gives us, <laughs> we're encouraged by that. And thank you to everyone, the presenters, the questions, the, the attendees. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Thank you. And don't forget the evaluation form. It should come when you close the, the, um, the session. And I think it's also emailed to you when we email the presentations and the, and the recording of the, of the session. Thank you very much and have a good day, everyone.